Wow. Good evening, everyone. That was a lovely introduction, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm so touched to see so many of you here um, for this talk, which I've titled rather ambitiously, Making Life Happier. And I'd like to start by acknowledging, as you all know, that I'm no happiness guru. I don't have all the answers to make our lives happier. But what I'm going to try and do this evening is share some of the things that have really had a big impact on my life, and I hope that um, might be of some help to others. I was encouraged by the team to sort of share a bit of my own personal journey and some of the things that had the biggest impact on me. Uh, and two of the things that have had a big impact, or rather two of the people that have had a big impact on me are two of my mentors who I'll refer to briefly this evening. But Richard Layard, one of the co-founders of Action for Happiness, has become a, a great friend and also a, um, a real mentor to me. And of course, I've also had the great privilege uh, to meet and spend some time with the Dalai Lama, who's the patron of Action for Happiness. So there I am, um, looking rather too excited in this photo, uh, and actually also rather embarrassingly wearing exactly the same <laughs> jacket as this evening, um, which shows the breadth and depth of my wardrobe. Um, I wanted to start with a question that's um, been on my mind for a good 15 years now, and is really at the heart of what we do with Action for Happiness. And it's this idea of what really matters in life. We're bombarded with all kinds of ideas in consumer culture, in marketing, everywhere we look around you know, a good life coming from certain stuff, certain possessions, certain activities. I think we know we're being marketed to a lot of the time when we see that stuff. But what does really matter in life? Well, I had an experience of a sort of waking up to recognize what matters at various points along my journey. And one exercise that really helped me do that uh, when I worked with a coach some years ago, it, it's also an exercise we use um, in the Action for Happiness course called Exploring What Matters. Actually, who here has taken part in an Action for Happiness course? Okay, great. So maybe about 5 or 10%. So um, apologies if you've seen this before. But what I'd like us to do to sort of illustrate this is to make this a little interactive starting point for this evening. So I'd like you to take a moment and to, if you, if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or just sort of lower your gaze. But I'd like you to imagine yourself in the future. So this is you towards the end of your life. Um, so maybe you've retired you know, many, many years from now. Hopefully you've got many years before we get near the end of, of life. Uh, and what you're going to be doing is sort of almost looking back at the journey you've had in your life, so the highs and the lows, the things you feel proud of and grateful for, the things maybe you not regret, but perhaps some of the, the difficult times, some of the things you wish you'd had a chance to do. So really try and get yourself in that mindset of your future self looking back on your life. How does it feel to be that much further down your journey and looking back? And so here's the question that I was asked in that kind of future self mindset, and I'd like to ask you now. What advice would your future self give you about what really matters? So when you've got the wisdom of perhaps being at the end of that journey and looking back, what might that future version of you say to you right now today? And in fact, I'd like to, because I think this is quite important, uh, maybe just spend a moment on this. So hopefully something has sort of emerged for you in terms of you know, what, what, what your future self might say, you know, along the lines of maybe do a bit more of this or maybe let go of this thing that does or doesn't matter. Um, so I'd like to invite you to turn again to somebody near you. It could be the same person again if you'd like to carry on that conversation or again turn the other side and chat to somebody else. But let's not leave anyone out of these conversations. And if you can just share something that came up for you in this little thought exercise about what really matters to you in life or maybe um, some wisdom that might come from your future self. Over to you just for a moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt you. We could probably spend the entire evening just on that one question, so sorry to interrupt your train of thought. I find myself saying something along the lines of spend more time doing things you care about and with people you love. Uh, and you may have found yourself 
saying similar or indeed different things, but I found that quite a, a, a wake-up call at various points on my journey. Um, one thing I've concluded does really matter, as you might imagine from what I now spend my life doing, uh, is, is happiness. And to sort of bring that to life, I just wanted to share one of my favourite ways of describing that from another great friend of ours, Matthew Ricard. He says, happiness is a deep sense of flourishing, not a mere pleasurable feeling or a fleeting emotion, but an optimal state of being. So, of course, those moment-to-moment emotional experiences do matter, but what we're talking about here is something a little bit sort of deeper and more whole life than just the sort of moment-to-moment. And that's what I think matters. And in fact, my vision, and I think hopefully the vision of many of us in this room, is for a world that is genuinely happier and kinder, which I think is a key component of, of happier Uh, In a world where we we all are able to meet our basic needs, I mean, we spend a lot of time thinking about our physical needs for shelter and food and so on, but we all have these emotional, psychological needs for a sense of connectedness to others, for a sense of control and autonomy in our lives, and a sense of sort of purpose and mastery, sort of getting better at things that matter to us. And sadly, at the moment, many, many of us in this world lack either our physical or emotional or indeed both sets of needs Uh, being met and what what I'd really love to see us being able to do is create a world where everyone has that potential to flourish. Uh, So that's what we've been working towards and what I've sort of committed the last sort of 15 years of my life to trying to support. Um, But I wanted to sort of go back a little bit because the team said why didn't you tell your story so I thought I'd start right at the beginning. Uh, No I I promise I'm not going to be sharing the entire life story but once upon a time there was a little chap called Mark who um, looked quite cheeky and chirpy and happy, and I sometimes get, people sometimes say to me, oh, you often seem happy, uh, are you just sort of this guy who's always, um, always smiling and always happy, and of course, uh, that's not the case, even, even back then. Um, I have, like all of us, my times of great grumpiness and, and misery and unhappiness, and that's part of the human condition. But it is good to see uh, that even then, I had um, failed to work out how to have two, two jackets. I still had the same, um, <laughs> the same tendency to wear the same thing every occasion. <laughs> um, on which note, I might actually ditch this, uh, this jacket. Uh, so I should note that I, I did have a, a great blessing that is so important in, a, in, in life generally of, of having a, a, a loving and um, fairly balanced and sane, as much as any family can be balanced and sane, um, background. Uh, I grew up in a small town called uh, Malvern, where the local publication is the Malvern Gazette, where, where things like a few rocks falling into the road make the front page of the local <laughs> newspaper. Um, but it, it was a very hap, sort of happy family environment. Um, but the one thing you don't want, um, even though the Morgan Gazette is not particularly well read um, around the UK as a whole, it is obviously very well read in the local Morgan community. And the one thing you don't want as a teenage boy, or a teenager of any gender, is to um, have embarrassing family coverage in your local newspaper. So for, if, for example, a journalist was to approach someone's mother and say, would you like to appear in a feature about how families spend Christmas? Uh, and they were to come to your house and photograph you in a cheesy Christmas shot and then put that in the paper to such an extent that every single one of your friends and their families would also read this and laugh at you for years to come. That, that wouldn't be ideal. Um, LAUGHTER But nevertheless, this uh, particularly awful photo did did appear in my local newspaper. And uh, and genuinely, my my friend's parents teased me about it for for years, let alone my friends. Um, So thank you, loving family. And then, of course, I went, as many teenagers do, slightly off the rails. Um, In years after that, I developed a ridiculous haircut that was genuinely a long fringe with an undershave underneath it. Um, And that hair, apparently, I used to claim it washed itself, so I didn't actually (laughs) get washed for a good six months or so, which is rather revolting. Um, So, you know, I had some difficult times in terms of uh, drinking too much, getting into a bit of trouble at school, not necessarily particularly behaving, but somehow... The journey has taken me from rock drama to meeting the, the Dalai Lama um, about 25 years later. So what I'm going to try and do is touch on a couple of things along that, that journey that have had a big impact on my life and helped me sort of 
recover from bad guitar playing rock wannabe to having the chance to meet and work with some of the most inspiring people um, around the world, which has been a real privilege. And of course, it's been a, a journey of ups and downs. And what I think many of you would have found in your lives is that many, many times it's the downs that teach us more than the ups. And so some of what I'm going to talk about this evening is about resilience and about how do we cope with difficult times. Again, I've been blessed to have not many major disasters in my life, but I think we all face darkness, we all face adversity, and how we deal with that is a challenge for all of us, I think, and certainly has been for me. So I've sort of chosen to share six different things that I have, that have been major points in my life that also, I think, have potential to be relevant and hopefully useful for others. One is about a surprising mind-body connection, something about priorities and finding purpose in life, something which I've called the big little things, um, a specific reference to happiness in dark times and some of the, these points I was just mentioning just then about adversity. Coming on to this idea of trying to change the world, you know, can we be ambitious in terms of social change as well as personal change? And then finally, none of this really matters if we don't find ways to make habits that last. So I'm going to say a little bit about turning good ideas, hopefully, into practices that stay and have, to some extent, managed to stay in my life. So I hope that sounds a bit like what you hoped you might hear. Um, and to support that, I mean, I'm obviously I'm not an author myself, um, but we do often bring books here. And so this evening, Primrose Hill Books have very generously brought along some books that, although I haven't written them myself, have had a big impact on my journey. And I'm going to mention a few of them along the way as well. So if you're wondering what the particular selection is tonight, these are all things that I'd highly recommend um, that have um, had a big impact along this sort of path. So... The first of these I'd like to share with you is what I've called a surprising mind-body connection. And I'd like to start this with, again, just encouraging you to think about something specific in your life, just keeping this relevant for all of us. So I'd like you to try and think of a time when your state of mind had a big impact on your health. So let's just take a moment to think about that. So it might be a time when you, know, you were in a particularly motivated, energetic frame of mind or, or something you were really excited about and you actually felt more enthusiastic and physically well as a result of, of that. Or it could have been a time when you were under a lot of pressure or stressed or really worried or dealing with some traumatic experience and you, and you found that as a result your health, your immunity, your resistance to infection, whatever it might be, was affected by that. So we haven't really got time to, to again, sort of stop and have a conversation about it. But just by show of hands, who, have, who here would say they've had some kind of connection between their state of mind and their physical health along their, your own journey? So, yes, yeah, so almost everyone. And, and, of course, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? We are whole human beings. But certainly, at a point in my journey, this was not something I was expecting. So I... Um, you know, after having finally got my hair cut a little bit, although it's still rather wrong, um, I, I got a degree, did all the kind of good things you might be expected, so um, had the great fortune to go and do a PhD, um, and then went into working life, became a management consultant, uh, whatever that is, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, had a, had a good job, lots of responsibility, fairly well paid, felt as though I was... Um, you know, doing some very important things with stock exchanges and investment banks and international projects and offshore teams and all kinds of words I've tried to remove from my brain since. Um, not very good at smiling during that phase of my life, I've noticed when looking back at old photos. But I was, you know, getting ahead, getting successful in, in conventional sense. But actually what was going on in parallel with that was I, I felt broken, actually. I was really stressed, although not really very good at acknowledging that, feeling disconnected from many of my friends and from the things I really cared about, and really sort of meaningless and empty. That was the sort of you know, feeling I eventually was able to recognize that I had, that I may have been successful in the eyes of the world, or at least some people in the world, but I wasn't feeling that way at all on the inside. And this came out for me in the form of chronic back pain. So I had a really horrific period of pain that, I, that meant I couldn't get out of bed sometimes. Uh, I was in constant agony for about two and a half years. I'd gone from being quite sporty to being sort of limping the whole time, really, really disabled by this chronic pain. Uh, I had an M MRI scans and various things, and I was told I had a damaged disc, and I had a hereditary degenerative spinal condition, and I could end up being permanently in a wheelchair from, you know, a few decades down the line, all of which was very frightening. And very debilitating. Now, my wife, Kate, um, was slightly further along the road to enlightenment than me at the time, and she recognised, while retraining to be an osteopath, that there might be some connection between 
my physical pain and my, you know, what was going on for me mentally. And this book, which is not one I brought this evening because I don't think it's in print anymore, but it was a book about back pain, but it was very cleverly uh, linked to sort of state of mind. And it helped me realize that actually what was causing all this very real muscle tension was just an unbelievable amount of stress and sort of repressed emotion. One of the things the book did was to say, do any of the following sound like you? A, work really hard. B, really care what other people think about you. And C, don't talk about your feelings very often. And that was very much me. I was um, you know, not able to express what was going on for me, and that was coming out um, physically in terms, of, in terms of pain. So I learned a skill, which of course many of you will now be familiar with and practice regularly, but I don't think I knew was even called mindfulness at the time. This is back in about 2002. So I learned some breathing exercises through that book, and I, and I cannot tell you how much that changed my life in terms of overcoming this back pain. I'd been in pain constantly for two years, and I was through learning some simple breathing techniques, able to be on my feet, mobile, and rejuvenated within literally uh, a month or so. It was absolutely remarkable. So I'm sure, well, unless it, again, by show of hands, who here has some kind of mindfulness practice that you use in your life? Yeah, an, an enormous number. I mean, that's way higher than the UK average. But of course, the UK average has changed massively in recent years. I'd like to just use this point while we're talking about mindfulness, just maybe to do a quick mindfulness exercise together if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind joining me in doing that. I, I'm, again, I'm no trained mindfulness teacher, but I have now been practicing this on a daily basis pretty much for something like 15 or so years. So um, why don't we uh, just take a moment just to relax in our seats. If you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or soften your gaze. Again, there's no particularly right way to sit, but just allow your hands to rest in whatever way feels natural. And let's just begin by just taking a few, maybe slightly deeper and more relaxing breaths than normal, and just really focus on that breathing. Just notice how it feels to breathe in and to breathe out again. And just notice that as you breathe in, maybe the chest and the lungs expanding. And as you're breathing out again, just notice how your body naturally relaxes again. And just take a moment to just notice this amazing life-giving thing, breathing that we do constantly all day, but so rarely place our attention on. And now let's bring our attention to our physical bodies. So just notice for a moment how your body feels as you're sitting in the chair this evening. Again, there's no right or wrong way to be sitting. Just notice how you're feeling physically. Maybe just gently scanning down through your body, starting with your head and just sort of paying attention to how different parts of your body feel. Some areas may feel with a little bit of tension, some areas may feel relaxed and calm. Again, just noting how you're feeling physically right now. Noting the contact you're making with the chair, maybe your feet on the floor. Just really feeling connected to your, your physical body and, and how it is right now. And just, just to end this little exercise, just bring your attention now finally to what we sometimes call the weather pattern inside, so your emotional state. So you may be coming here after a busy, stressful day. You might be in a really enthusiastic mood again. There's no right or wrong way to feel. Let's just notice how we are feeling right now. Without judging in any way, just noticing what you feel like on the inside. And just bring your attention back to your breath for just one or two more deep breaths before we end this exercise. And as you bring your attention back into the room and maybe open your eyes again if you close them, just take a moment to notice where we are, to notice the people around in this lovely space with these uh, lovely people. Um, so that was just a very brief taste. I'm sure many of you have, will have other ways of practicing mindfulness. Just a, a mindful moment. We like to start our meetings and get-togethers we do with Action of Happiness with a moment of mindfulness. Um, I found those two practices in particular, tuning into the physical sensations, transform my ability to deal with really, really serious back pain. Um, and also that idea of tuning into my emotional state was really transformative for me because I'd been not accepting the, the very real negative emotions I was experiencing. So another great learning for me from 
from this time in my life, which I'm really glad to see is now much more in the public conversation, this whole idea around being able to talk about our mental health. But this, this phrase, it's okay to not be okay, uh, I think is so important. And I think I'd never really acknowledged that. I'd been very much, it's all fine, I'm doing well, I grew up in a good Christian family, everything's great here, no problems to see here, folks. Um, and, you know, I'd gone through my life being, you know, seen to be successful, and that wasn't really the truth. And I think that ability to say it's okay and to show a bit of vulnerability was a real uh, lesson for me in terms of realizing that that actually wasn't a sign of weakness, it was more a chance to connect more authentically with other people and to really connect more authentically with myself, actually, as well. So for each of these different um, topics I'm going to just run through this evening, I'm, I'm going to just, at the end, share a few things that I, I found useful and that you might too. So uh, when it comes to mindfulness, I, I mean, there was all kinds of fabulous resources out there, but this book by Mark Williams... Uh, mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. That's Mark Williams, the leading mindfulness expert, not Mark Williamson, the amateur mindfulness uh, person you've just experienced. Uh, he's a wonderful man who has been here as well. Um, that's a great book. Uh, also, um, mindfulness-related, Headspace. There are many great apps that can help people learn mindfulness these days. I happen to have been using Headspace, and some of you may know we have a, a partnership with them where they do offer a free subscription to people who are involved in our community. So if you've been an active part of the Action for Happiness community and would like to have a, a subscription to Headspace, and do get in touch with me or with us afterwards, and we can potentially help arrange that. Um, who here does some kind of app-based uh, Headspace or other sort of mindfulness thing out of interest? Yeah, a really good proportion of us. Um, and then in, in terms of this point about mind and body being connected, some of you may remember Joe Marchant came and gave one of our talks. This is an amazing book about the connection between mind and body, this very real placebo effect that we all have. Our expectations about our physical health really does affect the outcome. Um, you know, one of the big things that led to my chronic pain was the fear I developed about not injuring my back. And when I was able to overcome that, it was utterly transformative. So I'd recommend all of those, and the, the two books are available here this evening. The second theme I wanted to move on to was this idea of priorities and finding a sense of purpose in life. So again, I'd like to start by opening this, this out to you and I'd like you to think about a time in your life when you may have been forced to or decided to change your priorities and perhaps discover a new sense of purpose or a new direction in your life. So again, let's just take a moment to think about some sort of change of direction or change of priorities that you've experienced maybe many years ago or perhaps fairly recently. And I think it would be nice, actually, in this case, just to take a moment again, just to share that with somebody near us, because I think it's, um, it's quite nice to bring this to life in a particular example. So if you feel willing and able, um, I'd love you just to turn to somebody next to you and just share something that led to you or a time when you changed direction or changed your priorities. Let's just um, share that with each other for a few seconds. Over to you. Okay, thank you, folks. Thank you. <laughs> Great to hear so much energy there. Clearly a topic that we, we've all experienced something of along our journeys. I, um, having been in that uh, sort of stressed out consulting world, decided I will recognise after that back pain that I wanted to change the direction, but I, instead of doing something... Um, you know, wise and pro-social, I thought, oh, I'll go off to business school and get a, a business degree and go and do something else commercial or interesting. And so I went off to IMD, a business school in Switzerland, where I was expecting I might move into a different sort of sector and get away from consulting and do something else deeply important. Um, and found myself again, uh, you know, surrounded by some wonderful, talented people, but actually really questioning what I was doing in my life. And... I was woken up to, thanks to a very, very wise sort of uh, psychology-led uh, sort of course and, and, and a coach and, and indeed um, therapist I ended up working with during that year, sort of woke up to this metaphor of myself and indeed probably most people on the MBA being on a ladder really, spending our whole lives charging up a ladder as fast as we can, you know, getting the grades, getting the job, getting the sort of importance or whatever it is we're pursuing but never really looking up to see what the ladder was leaning against. 
Um, and in this world of business degree, when we studied every industry under the sun, from aircraft manufacturing to ball bearings to shampoo to whatever, when I looked up that ladder and thought, where am I heading? The people I saw at the top of that, in, especially in you know, leaders of commercial businesses, I just felt, ah, that's, not the, that's leaning against the wrong building. That's not the ladder I wanted to be running up. So it was, a, again, a sense of questioning. And, and an exercise I did while um, out in Switzerland on this course really stayed with me as an exercise that, uh, well, again, helped me wake up to my priorities. So the exercise was quite simple to start with. It, was, it gave you, I think it was um, 18 things that could matter in life, from health to location to salary to um, you know, family, uh, you know, impact, influence, development, etc. And so you looked at this list and you had to choose the top six that were your kind of non-negotiables, at the bottom six, you didn't really care about, and the middle six that were sort of, you know, you liked and you'd be after, but weren't so important. And so I, I did this, and I spent a lot of time thinking about what my you know, priorities in life would be. Uh, and, I, and I noted down at the time, although I think looking back at this slide, I couldn't even write numbers in order uh, at the time, um, <laughs> which is slightly worrying. Um, but I, 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 I decided to myself that personal growth was my, you know, my top priority. Very, um, very good. Uh, my, my then girlfriend, now wife, Kate, was, was on the list, high up, and um, family, and at the time I hadn't yet had kids, uh, so that was referring to my sort of wider family. Uh, positive impact on society, really you know, starting to have this emergence to wanting to make a difference, and then friends and health, so kind of, you know, stuff that you might expect to be on one of these lists, that's all well and good. But then the rather cunning and slightly upsetting thing that we were asked to do next was to say, well, imagine that um, you're a detective and you've been following yourself around, or imagine a detective has been following you around for the last sort of three or four years, and what do you think they would think your top six priorities are? It's like, ah, yes. Uh, and I had to be honest with myself and say, well, you know, had I done that or a detective been following me, they would have concluded my priorities were work, success, income, influence, status, Kate, but not quite as high up the list, uh, and, and family, yes. Uh, so it was, it was a rather different list. You know, some were overlap, but basically the way I'd been living and the way I felt I wanted to live were out of whack. And I, that was, a, again, one of these wake-up calls for me of, you know, if I, if I really think this stuff, something's got to change quite dramatically. So, I, again, that was a big shift for me and, I, and an exercise I'd encourage you to, to use or share um, if you haven't done something similar previously. Um, and it reminded me of this, which I've seen more recently on Instagram, um, but I think it's got a similar wisdom in it, which is make a list of things that make you happy, make a list of things you do every day, compare the lists, adjust accordingly. Uh, I mean, that's obviously a slightly more flippant version, but there's some wisdom in that, which is so often we are um, living our lives sort of out of sync with what we'd really like to be doing. Now, some of that is inevitable. Some of us have to do jobs that we don't particularly love because it's our way of providing for our loved ones. It's not as easy as saying, oh, I'm just going to go and pursue things that make me happy every day. But I do think when we tune into what really matters to us, uh, as I was forced to, um, it, it can be quite shocking to realise this discrepancy. I sometimes talk about how I felt like I had a, a, a good life crisis. We talk about midlife crisis, and I think I was blessed to have woken up to some of the things that really matter without needing to have actually lost a job, lost a loved one, been you know, having a terminal diagnosis or some of these things that do often trigger these major life shifts in people. And I'd love all of us, really, to be able to experience a good life crisis, the ability to see what really matters whilst, you know, before it's too late, if you like, before we, it's something awful that wakes us up to it. Um, and I started questioning to myself when I realised that this thing about making a difference was on my list but not in my life, I was asking myself, well, what is progress? Well, we look around us and in many ways life is better than ever before, modern technology, more freedom, great breakthroughs in, you know, in innovation and cultural diversity and all kinds of amazing things. And yet when we look around us, we see a world of people who are not necessarily thriving, Anxiety, loneliness, disconnection. So, so are we making progress? And I became really interested in this whole topic, and that led me to Richard Leon's work and his seminal book, Happiness, uh, Lessons from a New Science, and this, this finding that even though our incomes have sort of doubled or trebled in recent decades, our levels of happiness have at best flatlined, perhaps even tailed off slightly. And that was sort of resonating for me. It's like, yeah, I've almost been pursuing that kind of growing the economic line without really delivering well-being, both personally, but actually as I look around me, that's what we're doing as a society. So I became really, really motivated by this idea of how do we, how do we shift our focus? How can we create a society that does prioritise the things that matter? Because we've really told a story about you know, racing to 
to success, you know, that success comes from being better than others. Uh, you know, the, the sort of us and them, and, you know, even in schools now, I look at this with our own children, the, the, the message we're told is like, you will succeed in life by being better, by getting ahead, by outdoing others. And that's a very sort of narrow-minded view. It's also a world where we can't have everybody having a happy life. If it's a zero-sum game and you can only be happier by being better than others, then not everyone wins. And, of course, what's also possible is the much more compassionate side of our nature where we are more connected, more collaborative. Success is a communal thing, not a, an individualistic thing. So that became a really strong motivator for me and, has, of course, has driven a lot of what we've done with Action for Happiness as well. And I came across at this time in my life something which really helped me put this into practice and actually led to me really being on this stage this evening. A chap called Neil Croft had written a book called uh, Authentic. Uh, this is now maybe 15, 20 years ago he wrote this book. But I came across Neil's work, and although it wasn't in that book, I don't think, he has a model for how he felt everybody had the potential to find their own life purpose. And I thought, well, that sounds good. I'd love to find my life purpose. And his, his model was, if we can combine these three spheres of our life, so talent, passion, and change, then we all have the potential to discover our life's purpose. And really the way to do that is just to answer a simple question. The first one being, what are your real talents? What are you actually good at? Not just in terms of your work skills, um, like being good at analysis, but some of your human skills, problem solving, listening, whatever it might be. The second question, what are you passionate about? You know, that might, might or might not be the same as what your talents are, but you might be passionate about young people or the environment or you know, outdoor activities or whatever it might be. We, you know, but it's something that really gets us out of bed motivated in the morning. And the third and perhaps most interesting question was, what would you like to see change in the world? Or, or as he sometimes expressed it, what makes you angry in the world? So I, I'll share in a moment where that led me, but I'd just like you to maybe take a moment to think about your own answer to this. So... What are your talents? What do you really feel that you're, you're good at? What are your passions? What do you really feel motivated by? What topics do you, do you love? What gets you out of bed feeling energetic in the morning? And thirdly, what would you like to see different in the world? What makes you frustrated? What would you like to change? And I, I do think there's something really powerful in this model. That if you can find a way of combining your talent and your passion to do something about that change, then that really is something very uniquely to, you know, purposeful to you, but also could have a very big impact on the world. So when I did this exercise, I ended up writing a rather sort of badly written and long sentence along the following lines. To use my, my, my purpose is to use my talent for organising things, I guess that came from my commercial background, and my passion for authentic happiness, this sort of topic I'd been waking up to, what really makes us happy, to change priorities in our society uh, and help people focus on what really matters. So I, I ended up writing down that. That isn't the exact piece of paper because I was looking for it today and couldn't find it. But that's pretty much what I had on a scrap of paper. Put it in a drawer and didn't think much more of it. And then, as these remarkable things sometimes do happen, I happened to discover an article in the Times written by my now friend and mentor, Richard Layard, uh, who was talking about wanting to start a movement. Uh, in fact, they even created a skeletal website with this rather intriguing graphic on it. Um, I'm not sure what these little um, green things are, but the movement for happiness um, was what it was being described as. When I mentioned to friends that I was thinking about doing this, uh, one of them said, movement for happiness, that sounds like a cure for constipation. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought we'd better brand it slightly differently. Um, but Richard was writing about, you know, uh, it's possible to change society, help people be happier. We know that as a, a society has become richer, our happiness has not risen in step. We want to create a new movement. So I had the chance to connect with Richard and Anthony and managed to persuade them somehow to let me come on board and sort of give my life to, to running this. And the rest is history, really. But what was intriguing for me, well, no, actually challenging for me, was that I knew I had to do this because I'd written down this is what my purpose was in life. But actually, when I mentioned this to my parents, to my wife, to my friends, they almost all said something, well, they either laughed in the case of my friends or they, they said something along the lines of, you're going to do what? You're going to leave this other work you love, because I was doing a different job on climate change at the time, to go and do some weird happiness thing. Why would you do that? But because I'd been through that process of saying this is what my purpose in life is, when this opportunity to connect with Richard and do this came up, I knew that that was sort of my calling in a way. So that's really why I've ended up here. And what it's led me to realize is that was, a, again, a big cathartic moment for me because I was then involved in launching Action for Happiness, as we ended up calling it, uh, and all the wonderful things I've had the privilege to be involved in since then, which I will say a little bit more about 
towards the end. Uh, but I was also, a year or so later, working with someone who was doing an art project. And her art project involved asking people this question, what is true of you but not obvious to others? And then she then painted it on the body and took did some very cool art with it. I can't find the, the photo she took of me, unfortunately, but, or maybe fortunately. Um, but, but my answer to the question turned out to be, what's true of me but not true to others is, is actually that I'm a recovering people pleaser. What I'd realized was... Throughout my life, pretty much, I've been pleasing people. I've been trying to you know, be a good son and trying to get good grades and trying to please people. And actually, in being brave enough to say, I want to sort of you know, quit what I'm doing and do this happiness thing, even in the face of laughter from people I really loved, actually was a sign of me being be beginning to follow my own instinct rather than being dependent on what other people thought was the right thing to do. Um, so I like that phrase, recovering people pleaser, and I particularly like this version of it I found online today. I'm a recovering people pleaser. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, people pleasing to the last. Uh, so in terms of this, this, this theme of priorities and finding purpose, again, that's a little bit of my own journey, but a couple of books I've just brought along this evening. One is Richard Layard's Happiness book that really woke me up to the importance of happiness and how we can change priorities as a culture. And related to that, it's now a few years old, but Sue Gerhardt's book, The Selfish Society, um, how we all forgot to love one another and made money instead, is a, is a brilliant kind of uh, description of some of the challenges we face and how it ties back to even our attitudes towards parenting in early years and how that's had this effect on sort of contributing to the culture we've got today and perhaps what we can do about it. So those are just two of many I could have recommended that had a big impact on me. I want to move on, and I promise we're going to get through these next ones a little bit uh, quicker. But the next theme I wanted to mention was what I've called the big little things. Because um, again, well, let me just ask you the question first before I share my own journey. I'd like you to think of a time when you appreciated something that you'd been previously taking for granted. It's a bit like my, you know... Um, sort of recognising that, you know, loved ones, or I thought they were high on my list, were not, you know, I wasn't really prioritising them. What, what, sometimes it's when we, we lose something or someone that we finally wake up to how much of a big impact they've had on our lives. So, again, try and bring to mind something that you, uh, you know, you feel that you now can appreciate and be grateful for. It may have been something that you... Um, you, you, you thought of when Vanessa did that lovely exercise at the start, you know, something we're grateful for that might be in the last day or so, but it could just be something we're grateful for in our lives, a person that means a lot to us and so on. Um, again, I won't take time now to do a little interactive exercise, partly because I think we've done lots in this room and one at the beginning tonight on, on moments of gratitude, but I really do think this idea of gratitude as a way to, to recognise what we risk taking for granted is so powerful. And, and so... When we launched Action for Happiness, one of the first things we did, and Vanessa has been the lead on this and a great inspiration, was looking at all the science of well-being and the things that really do make a big impact on our well-being that were within our control. I'm sure many of you will have seen the 10 Keys to Happier Living on many occasions before. Uh, there's all kinds of resources to support this online. Uh, I'm not going to run through them all in detail, but the, the idea of Great Dream and uh, these different contributors have played a huge part in my life and also in the work of Action for Happiness. But perhaps above all... Um, I have to say this one on emotions and looking for what's good, which is where the gratitude sits, has had a really, really lasting impact on my life. Uh, I was very sceptical about this. Uh, I really didn't think this would be something I'd do or indeed would necessarily work. Um, the exercise is classically thinking of good things that have happened during the last day or so and being encouraged to write them down at night. It's sometimes referred to as keeping a gratitude journal, uh, which as a British male, certainly at the time I first came across it, I thought, well, that's not the sort of thing I'm, I really do, keeping a gratitude journal. But I was encouraged to try it when I came across the science, because, of course, there's a very strong reason why we naturally focus on what's wrong. We have an evolutionary instinct to be on the lookout for danger and what might go wrong. We would never have survived as a species without that instinct. But actually, uh, it's quite remarkable how little we, we focus on the good things. In fact, before I come on to that, that data, who, who here would say that you regularly, maybe on a daily basis, stop and consciously think about things you're grateful for and maybe write them down or at least mentally note them? Great. I mean, wow, that's amazing. So that's like a third of us in this room do that. And I, if I do that with a typical audience, it's about 2 to 5%. So, I mean, that's, that's way higher than normal. But isn't that interesting? Even in a really engaged group of people who've come to a talk on happiness and may have been to some of these events before, even less than half of us do this. We spend so much time thinking about what's wrong and not very much time 
consciously focusing on, on what's good. And the data on this uh, is really, really powerful. So when people were asked to do this just um, uh, each night for one week in a proper randomized placebo-controlled trial like you might do for a, a new drug, uh, this was found to have a really amazing impact on increasing happiness and reducing the risk of depressive symptoms. So when I saw this, the sort of scientist in, my, in me thought, well, okay, well, I'll give it a go. And I started this daily practice, and I've been doing it on and off almost daily since now for about five years, and it's been utterly transformational um, in helping me reframe difficult things, but also helping me realize how much I was taking for granted, how many times I'd be caught up in a cycle of, oh, it's been a terrible day, and this is a disaster, and I was just missing the little good things. And some of you may have heard that lovely quote, which says something like, enjoy the little things because one day you'll look back and realize they were the big things. And I always find that really quite motivating. Um, you might have seen that uh, an Action of Happiness supporter, a um, guy in the US called Wes, created a rather nice app called What's Good, uh, which helps track three good things each day. We haven't promoted it too widely because it's unfortunately only available on iOS um, and therefore not for people who use all devices. But I've been using this regularly for you know, hundreds of days now and uh, it also allows you to track your happiness day to day and I thought I'd, um, I flicked through it today and picked out a day that had a particularly low happiness score and I thought I'd just look back at one particular entry of my gratitude list from that day and it said this, Today was really hard. Poor Daisy, that's my daughter, injured in an A&E. I had upset stomach and in pain. Kate found a mouse in our bedroom and dishwasher broken. <laughs> but we made it through. And so that's interesting. So I, I, I'd completely forgotten about that day. And I, I, I do now recall it was not a pleasant one. But, you know, no one died. It wasn't the end of the world. And I was able to say, but we made it through. So even in that kind of quite difficult day that had a rather low score, this exercise has helped me sort of just keep a sense of perspective. Because at the end of the day, a mouse and a tummy ache and a, you know, Daisy w was injured but wasn't actually as injured as we initially thought. You know, we can cope more effectively than we think and gratitude is a great tool for doing that. So just in terms of this theme, a, a couple of resources, hopefully you're already aware of a book that's here for most of our events and again this evening, the wonderful Ten Keys book that Vanessa has written that has, I think it's the most evidence-based sort of self-development and, and, and other helping book out there. It's hundreds and hundreds of scientific references, but all brought to life in a really engaging way. So if you haven't already checked that out, do. But these days, we also have the monthly calendars. Who here has seen our monthly calendars? Wow, loads of you. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, three million people have been using these things now, which is just amazing. And it all came from this brilliant uh, volunteer and supporter of ours called Peter, who came up with the original kindness calendar idea. We now have an app that goes with it. So if you've not... Uh, try the official Action of Happiness app, which you can find on all the um, app stores now. It gives you the little action each day and various inspiring things. Anyone using the app at this stage? Hooray! Cool. It seems to be getting good ratings. I'm slightly worried about apps because what, um, what I find is quite bad for well-being is being constantly pinged by things. So having a happiness app that makes you unhappy would not be good. Uh, so uh, lots of things to follow up on that. But again, just encouraging that practice of daily gratitude. I'm going to move on from that to a sort of related theme around happiness in dark times. And again, I'd just like you to think of a time when you face a dark situation, but you were able to respond constructively in some way. And of course, I, you know, many of you will have experienced dark situations that are far worse than anything I've um, necessarily experienced. But of course, you know, we can't really compare each other's darkness. We all have these difficult times, whatever it's caused by. Um, but just try and bring to mind something that was really difficult for you, but, but particularly one where you feel as though you were actually able to do something constructive in response. Might, again, might have been something recently, a difficult project, a, a family incident, a, a, something you got wrong, an illness, um, you know, something that happened to a loved one, or it could be something from many years ago. So I, I think it would be nice to stop at this point and just to have you a chance to reflect with someone next to you again. So maybe turn back to the person that you first spoke to this evening and, and just share some way that you've responded constructively to a difficult time in your life and just listen to theirs as well because I think this stuff is so important. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sure some of what you've shared um, 
you know, within the room this size, there will have been people who've been through all kinds of trauma and adversity. So, um, you know, I don't want to speculate on what you may have shared or what may have come up for you when thinking about this. And the example I wanted to share from my own experience is a very recent one, and also in the light of um, many of these things, rather trivial, but had a big impact on my own sort of state of mind just a few weeks ago. Um, we got hacked, um, Action for Happiness did, and um, we, we realized that our emails were not getting through, someone had sort of disabled our, the domain that was handling our mail services. We later discovered because they wanted to reset our Twitter ID and password via that email address and then start posting obscene content on Twitter, which when you're a movement to promote uh, kindness and happiness, doesn't seem like a particularly good fit and was really distressing at the time, both in terms of how to respond technically, but also in terms of just these awful messages going out on our feed to people that we really care about. And it was really hard to deal with. Um, you know, again, no one's died. It's all put writable, but left me in a difficult place. And I'm very grateful to the team for their support in coming to terms with that and putting it right. Uh, but of course, whenever I'm facing those kind of moments, I, I now, having read and, and studied Viktor Frankl's work, I often bring to mind Viktor Frankl. Who here has come across Viktor Frankl or read Man's Search for Meaning? Yeah, amazing story. He was um, in Auschwitz uh, in a concentration camp, and he said this most amazing thing in this wonderful book. Everything can be taken from a man, or indeed a woman, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. You know, and he was able to say this in a place where people around him were dying, his life was, life was under threat, he was malnourished, it was just horrific conditions. And so if Viktor Frankl was able to define that inner resilience in that situation, then you know, hopefully we're able to use that in a rather more mundane thing, like a Twitter profile being temporarily hacked. Uh, and of course, this comes to this idea of resilience and resilient thinking, and, and Vanessa and others do great work on helping people learn resilient skills. I, I think this model, the ABC, and the basic idea of cognitive behavioral therapy, which many of you will be familiar with, should be not just taught as it is to help people dealing with sort of mental challenges, but it should be a life skill that every child learns in school and in, in, that we pass on through our families. And the ABC model is a rather simplistic way of looking at this, but I find quite helpful, where A is adversity, something goes wrong, and C is the consequences how I feel and what I do as a result, we say, oh, she made me so angry, and then we might lash out or whatever. But we forget that between the adversity that's outside us and the consequences of how we feel and act, there's also a, a be a belief or sort of an underlying thought, if you like, about that situation. So she made me so angry is actually perhaps more how I've chosen to interpret her behavior has made me really angry. Um, and that, that opens up a choice. It, anger might be the entirely right response in that situation, but at least we have the ability to, to sort of question that and don't necessarily get drawn into these um, emotions. So coming back to that example of the, the hack, I mean, my initial belief was like, oh no, people are going to think we're awful. Like They're going to think we're posting horrific content. They're going to like lose their faith in action for happiness. And I got into this whole cycle of worrying that this would be really detrimental and really upset people and cause all these problems. And what I was able to do was to reframe that, to recognize that, well, actually, no. I mean, our community are probably going to recognize this for what it is. And in fact, loads of people wrote to us within minutes saying, hey, guys, I think you've been hacked. They're posting stuff that's nothing like what you would share. And it was like, oh, of course, people know what we stand for. Uh, and, and that was, you know, really, uh, again, a nice reminder that, uh, you know, that you can interpret the same situation in different ways. And it always reminds me of this poster of ours, which I think has always been one of the most popular ones. It says, if you can't change it, change the way you think about it. That's really the key to resilience. Of course, we want to put things right, and if we can act to save the world, we should. But if lots of things are outside our control, and therefore the way we respond to them is the thing that we can control. That's been a learning for me. And I just wanted to share the two books that I think are, are brilliant on this and really both harrowing and both actually Holocaust-related rather darkly. But Man's Search for Meaning I've been recommending for years for the obvious reasons after what I've just said. But has anyone here come across The Choice uh, recently? Has anyone read this book? It's a fairly recent book, and it's also about this lady Edith's experience being in Auschwitz. And it's just the most amazing book I've read in recent years. It's ultimately incredibly hopeful. She became a, a very wise therapist and actually writes this from a current day perspective looking back. But it's just astounding what she went through, but just amazingly wise about how being able to come to terms with our past and process that in a healthy way and choose how we respond to it is just the most important thing in life. So I would, again, I brought both of those along this evening and would recommend them 
uh, in slightly different ways. So that's that one. And let's move on to getting towards the, the sort of last couple of themes. And this one is rather outward looking about trying to change the world. As you probably detected, I've become uh, you know, very motivated by how do we help make the world a better place in a rather sort of utopian and idealistic way. My mum laughs at me now because she says I may have lost the uh, Christian zeal that the family had historically. I, you know, I, I, I consider myself to be a sort of secular promoter of well-being rather than a religious one these days. Um, but she said I've not lost the missionary zeal. So my, you know, my family, has, there's, there's always been a kind of promotion of uh, that Christian ethic, and I, although I've lost the, the, the dogma of faith, if you like, I've kept the desire to convert others, um, <laughs> for good or bad. Uh, so what, 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 where's that taken me in my journey, and, and particularly where's that taken action for happiness? So I just wanted to pay tribute, first of all, to the amazing uh, people who got involved in this movement, the volunteers who were here this evening and at so many of these events. And uh, this, is, this was taken at the lovely event with the Dalai Lama a few years ago when he was with us. Uh, Many of the same faces still here now, but um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's given their time to support this movement. <laughs> the, the idea that we had from the start was this idea of a personal pledge, and I've been trying to put this into practice, and I know others in the room do as well. Trying to create more happiness and less unhappiness in the world around us. That's basically it. So this starts with us. We can campaign for change. We can vote for people. We can, you know, uh, you know sort of be activists in our lives. But we, we, we start with the way we treat our friends and our neighbours and our loved ones and our partners and our children and the people around us day to day. That's where it begins. And this is important because we started to recognise within our work, and I'm using this narrative more than I was before, that there are these two sides to human nature that are both very real. We do have a, a self-interested side. We are hardwired to sort of, you know, survival of the fittest instincts about, you know, looking out for threat and perhaps worrying about people from different groups and, uh, you know, this, this sort of fight or flight response that we have for very good reason within us. But it does lead to, at a cultural level, a sort of sense of fear, distrust, competition and so on. Uh, we also have a, a very strong instinct with us to be more cooperative and com compassionate, to sort of see the common humanity, to work together, to have this sort of care and connect system within us that helps nurture and build community. And these are both real and both uh, within us. What we really want is a world that brings out the cooperative side of human nature over the self-interested side. But if you look at our politics, you look at our workplaces, you look at our schools even, the way most of our culture is built now really brings out the self, you know, get ahead of others, fear of the other. I mean, I think the, the populism that we saw in, in some of the narrative around Brexit and some of the narrative around the Trump election in the US has been basically stoking up a mass societal fight or flight response. Fear of the other, all your problems are down to other people. And really, we've, you know, especially as we've let go of religion, actually, in, in a lot of um, Western culture, we've let go of a sense of common shared ethics, like how do we behave, how do we treat each other, and the Dalai Lama is very interested in this idea of secular ethics, and this whole idea is at the heart of what we're doing now, which is how do we live well, what are our values in a world that encompasses all faiths and none, uh, because materialism and capitalism are a, a, a poor substitute for, for values and a sort of self promotion doesn't really fill that void. So that's really, again, underneath a lot of what we're doing with Action for Happiness, and it's been really motivating for me. And it comes back to this idea of, well, how can I therefore be the change? How can I be more of that compassionate person? So the, the unifying thing with Action for Happiness is that we can each make a difference. And there are lots of lovely examples. So some of you who came to that, did anyone come to that event with the Dalai Lama back in 2015? Anyone here? Yeah, so maybe... 10 or 20 people, brilliant. Um, you'll remember Jasmine came on stage. Jasmine had had a really horrible experience of chronic pain, but had a really transformative experience on one of our courses and then went on to really help others in a similar situation. So personal being the change in your own life and then taking that to others. Community, um, many of you will have heard the wonderful story of Stan who launched our Happy Cafe network uh, with the Brighton group initially, but it's now spawned over 100 happy cafes in communities all around the UK. And today is particularly brilliant uh, for this whole movement and for Stan because I just heard yesterday that Stan has been awarded um, a, what's called a Points of Light Award by the Prime Minister. He's had a letter from the Prime Minister congratulating him on the contribution he's made to promoting mental well-being in local communities. And Stan is in fact here this evening and now... Um, so, good work, Stan. I am... Um, I, I love the thought that Theresa May has just taken half an hour out of her Brexit negotiations to go, I'll just write to Stan today. Uh, that's brilliant. 
Uh, but it's, it's a genuine quote from Theresa May. Uh, so do check that out on our, on our website. And thank you, Stan, for that. Because that's, you know, that's a lovely example of one person creating something locally that just has this sort of unexpected ripple. And of course, you give so much of your time, as do many others, so generously to support that. I mean, Stan mails out action packs to every happy cafe, wherever they are in the world, from his own house, out of his own love for this idea, which is just uh, amazing. Um, in schools, Adrian was also at that event with the Dalai Lama, a lovely example of someone who's taken these ideas and transformed the school he works in and has inspired many other schools. He's now written an amazing book on well-being in primary schools, which is going really well. Uh, Seema was someone who brought this idea into her major company. Many other companies have, have brought these ideas um, to life, led by individuals who are passionate about changing the culture. And of course, our own Richard Laird has a big impact on policy. He meets the Secretary of State for Education. He goes and organizes you know, dinners on mental health and the health service and all kinds of things. So we can each make a difference in our own way. That's the central idea of, of the movement. Perhaps the most important thing we've done, though, is to help that come to life in communities. And through the amazing work that um, Alex and Tanya and the team do to support all of the course leaders and the amazing volunteers around the country running our eight-week course called Exploring What Matters, which I know many of you in this room have experienced, and many of you will have probably run as well, because it's all volunteer-led. And the model behind that course is this, this three-pronged thing that I think is really the essence of what I'd like to get across when it comes to changing ourselves and changing the world, this idea of tune in, connect, take action. That's what happens in these gatherings, and it's why I think it becomes potentially life-changing. So tuning in is a bit of that mindfulness and gratitude, being able to recognize where we are and be at peace with what's going on for us and working out what really matters, as I've been talking about earlier. Connecting, then, is the conversations we're having. You've had some this evening, but when we get together face-to-face, -to -face, we really can bond with others and it builds something more substantial. And then taking action. None of this really matters if we don't act on it. So that's what happens in the course. And, of course, it's what happens, I'm sure, in many of the things you'll have done in your own lives that are, that are meaningful. You know, a bit of self-awareness, a bit of conversation, a bit of putting it into practice. So, again, I would encourage you to to get involved in that process, whether it's through one of our courses or the way you just approach your own interactions in your communities and, and your friendship groups, because it really is transformative. And I wanted to share a story. A lady came to us at an event we organized uh, last summer and shared a story about her experience of going on one of these courses. And I just thought it was a lovely example, just one of many. She's called Shirley, and she said, the course was life-changing for me and lots of others too. We made new friendships and took positive actions in our lives based on what we discussed. We've continued to stay in touch, meet up, and support each other, and one lady I met has actually become my best friend. Last weekend, we got together for the launch of a new local community centre, which lots of us have been working on. It's so great to feel part of something meaningful and to be connected to others near where I live. I'm so much happier, and none of this would have happened without that course. So, I mean, she met people on her course. She said, near me, there was a, one guy was a taxi driver, somebody was unemployed, somebody was a student struggling with the course they were on. And she said, basically, people, we live right next to each other, but we would never have met had we not sort of been encouraged to get together locally. And at a time when loneliness is on the rise and we spend so much time staring at our screens and so little time connecting with the people around us, I, I think that part of our role here, all of us, is to help rebuild that face-to-face that -face community that's so important. So those stories are lovely, and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, hearing those kind of bits of feedback. But we've also done, now done a randomized control trial, a proper scientific evaluation of the course, which looks at how do people's lives change relative to a control group of equivalent people just getting on with their lives. And it shows that things like really big increase in life satisfaction, that's about the same increase you see when somebody goes from being unemployed to employed, or from not in a relationship to being you know, happily married. Um, so really quite substantial. Big reductions in depression and, and anxiety as well. And perhaps my favorite of all, a big increase in social trust. That's something that's fallen dramatically in recent decades. Over half of us used to say that most other people can be trusted, and now it's like, you know, it's, it's less than a third. You know, we've really lost this sense of trust, partly because of this populist narrative of fear of the other. We can rebuild that. When we reconnect face-to-face, -face, when we tune in, connect, and take action, we can rebuild a sense of togetherness, and I'm really passionate about that. And, and so just a couple of resources that you're probably aware of. Uh, we now have these monthly get-togethers, especially being used by people who've been on courses. They follow the same themes of our calendars. Uh, so we've, the calendars, we've just had um, Friendly February on relationships, Mindful March on awareness at the moment. We're going to go into Active April and then Meaningful May and Joyful June. And so the slightly painful alliteration continues. Uh, um, 
So if, you're, if you've liked the calendar and you'd like to get together and tune in and connect, take action with others, uh, or you've been doing that off the back of one of your groups, we now have a set of resources to help you do that. So again, um, come and find out more about how that works. But we just want to help people get together and have these conversations that matter, as we call them, as often as possible. And that really brings me to the last theme uh, of this evening and ties into that really, which is none of this really matters unless we can put it into practice. So how can we make things happen? It's all we were reading books and coming to events and hearing someone waffle on on the stage about stuff. But how do we build this into our lives? So I'm a big fan of this idea of trying things out and experimenting. Sometimes called N equals 1 experimentation. So people who know about psychology studies, you, know, you have an N equals 200, which is a study with 200 people in. N equals 1 is just like a try it out on yourself. It doesn't really, you, know, you can't say conclusively whether it's good or bad, but at least you've kind of worked out your own response to it. And there's been a bunch of things that have had a big impact on my life that I've dabbled with and have really, I've gone, oh, that's interesting, that's really helped. So one is singing. I joined a community choir about seven years ago um, and it's, it became a really big part of my life. I've not been able to do it as much over the last sort of six months or so, but um, getting together with others, um, not singing very well. I have to say it was a little community choir, not particularly high standards, but just the joy of being with others, making a creative noise together. We went out and um, did, did some sort of mini flash mob things. I think we sang Hey Big Spender in Sainsbury's once, which was quite fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is a little um, community concert that we put on in the, in the bandstand uh, near where I live. Um, and it's just a really rewarding thing. So, I mean, you know, you'll all have your own equivalent of singing something creative, something maybe music or something that gets you out with others. Uh, but I, again, it was, it was surprising to me when I did that how much it would change how I felt. So of a, of a stressful evening, I'd be like, oh, I haven't really got time to go to choir tonight. And then I'd go, and it would just really lift my mood amazingly. So... Um, Second, perhaps no surprise to anyone who knows me well, I mean, cycling has become a big passion of mine. Um, I tried out loads of different sports and types of activity throughout my life and sort of did them rather begrudgingly and then discovered how much I just love cycling. This is me and a friend on top of a, a, a sort of, um, it's called Col de, Col de Zouard. It's like a major climb in the Tour de France, which we finally got up after many hours uh, of struggling. But I, I've become really, really into this thing that I now find gives me a real sense of joy. And that was what was missing for me for years, actually. Exercise was a chore, and then I found a particular form of it that was just really joyful. I think of, I've got a T-shirt, actually, that says, uh, cycling is my meditation, because for me, that is my chance to sort of reconnect, to to breathe, to sort of come to terms with what's going on. And so I'm not saying go out and put ridiculous lycra on in the way that I do, but, uh, but find the, the form of activity that connects with you, that you find the joy in, not just the sort of, it's not about the health benefits so much as the kind of, I love this. That's what it's been for me. Another one that's had a big impact on me is experimenting with what I eat. I, I had always been one of the people who just ate anything. And then, uh, in my case, when I discovered the idea of just getting rid of sugary processed stuff, um, and sort of kind of reducing the amount of processed and refined carbs in my diet and just eating more fresh and kind of healthy fat type stuff. And it was just transformative to my, not only to my physical health, but also I slept better, felt calmer, uh, had more energy, like really interested to see how a changing, you know, nutrition had a much bigger impact on my state of mind than I thought it would. And uh, another thing I've dabbled with, which again, I... Uh, has found really helpful. I'm a bit geeky and have a, I'm someone who sort of sticks to a to-do list. So I use to-do lists to try and manage my life. And that's fine in terms of getting stuff done. Vanessa was laughing about my focus on productivity. I think it was a, a sort of tribute. But, but, but it was, uh, but I, you know, people who know me know I like to try and get stuff done. But I've tried to build into my to-do list more of a to-be list. So as well as the reply to email, write report, you know, call up journalist, whatever it might be that I need to do for my working life, Every day I have a, a to-do item that is, do, you, do, you, do your mindfulness practice. And another one at the end of the day, which is stop and write down what's been good today. And another one, which I'm going to come on to in a moment, which has become a mantra for me as well. So actually building in these things that are, are about how I am, how I can be, how I would like to be in my day, not just the stuff that needs to be done, collect kids from school, you know, order presents for whatever. It's the remember just to take a moment. So I, I'm as religious now in sort of doing the the daily mindfulness and gratitude, for example, as I am about ticking other things on my list. And that's been really helpful for me because it kind of gives me permission to not let that slip. But I wanted to, uh, you know, and I'm not saying these are the right answers for you, but I do think this idea of experimenting and uh, dabbling and trying out and noticing what works, because there were plenty of other things that I tried that didn't 
have as big an impact. But one that's been quite um, entertaining, but really surprisingly powerful for me recently, uh, which I wanted to share with you, partly because it makes me laugh. But um, has anyone come across Kristen Neff, a uh, brilliant self-compassion researcher? She came here and did a brilliant talk a few years ago. And she did an exercise where she said, imagine that a loved one has got something wrong or made a mistake and they've kind of really screwed it up in some way. And imagine how you would just want to comfort them in that situation. What would your body language be like? What kind of words would you say to them to sort of um, help them deal with that, sort of messing things up? And you know, we all imagined that, and I find myself saying quite calm and comforting things. And then she said, now imagine you've messed something up yourself, you've screwed up, you've made a mistake. Now, what kind of language do you normally use to yourself? And I realized that I'm, I kind of like, I use... Words like, and, um, <laughs> and I often have a rather kind of, uh, you know, very negative inner dialogue, I'm like, I really f that up. Um, and I have developed a mantra, which I now use, that helps me. It's the first time I found something that helps me in the moment of that angst and that rage or that angle, negative response, to just stay mindful and tune in. So for me, FCK, or frick, uh, is now friendly... <laughs> calm and kind. And, and I've been working on this for maybe about three months now. And so I have now got to the point where in that moment of like, oh, I've, I'm actually able to remember this, partly because I find myself saying a certain F word. And I just think friendly, calm and kind. And it, not always, because sometimes the, the emotions we're dealing with are difficult to deal with. But that's really helped me, actually. It's really helped. That's, this is how I want to be in the world. I want to be friendly, I want to be calm, I want to be kind. And right now, this is difficult, but that's how I'd like to be. So I don't know what your equivalent to that mantra would be, but I, I found this not only helpful, but also quite entertaining in my moments of, um, of darkness recently. So I, again, would encourage you to try out little habits and find the things that work and then make them part of your sort of daily schedule because it's really helped me tremendously. And just a couple of resources. So one related to, to habit formation. Um, Gretchen Rubin wrote an interesting book called The Happiness Project years ago, um, which is kind of good tips for how to be happier. I think her sequel, Better Than Before, is much better because it's about habits. It's about, okay, you can know what makes you happy, but if you don't know how to make it practical, it doesn't really help. So this is a brilliant book about behaviors and how to sort of build behaviors into your life. Things like habit bundling, which is if you know that you want to, for example, go to the gym more, but you also know that you love watching a box set, Make a rule in your head where you're only allowed to, or sorry, not a box set, like a series on TV. Make a rule where you're only allowed to like, watch your favorite series if you're sitting on an exercise machine in the gym. You know, kind of bundle your habits together. So she's got all kinds of like, really interesting, insightful little quirky tips. And then the other one, which is a bit of a, a, a random topic, but I had wanted to do something on relationships, but we haven't really got enough time. But this book on nonviolent communication also had a huge impact on my life, Marshall Rosenberg, this ability to sort of be able to express our needs without it going into an argument. So we all have challenging relationships. It's another one I've brought along this evening. So if you're interested in enhanced relationships and how to sort of respond more compassionately to others, absolutely incredible book and, and set of principles. Who here has come across nonviolent communication and used it before? Yeah, great. I thought there'd be quite a few. Excellent. Um, so... That's kind of my whistle-stop tour through things that have had an impact on my life. I'm conscious of the fact we're, we're not that far off the end, and I want to leave time for questions and reflections. But I'd like to ask you to think about, of all the things we've sort of touched on this evening, what might you do? What might you take away that could help make life happier? It could be for you, but it could also be for others. Um, so maybe you know, there's something about the connection between mind and body. Maybe there's something about priorities and shifting direction. Maybe there's something about being able to just use more gratitude in, in daily life. Perhaps it's something about dealing more sort of constructively in dark times and being resilient. Maybe it's a way of helping reach out to others, volunteering, running a course, spreading the word, you know, making that social change. Or perhaps it's just something you're going to sort of build into your daily life to help make a habit stick. Whatever it is, I'd encourage you to, um, to try and think of something specific, actually. So maybe let's just take a moment to bring to mind one particular thing that's on your mind. It could be one of the things I've talked about, or it could be something that is on your mind differently. But let's try and bring to mind, let's all leave here with one thing in our minds that we will actually do as a result of being here this evening. It might be something to do with a, f a relationship. It could be something to do with, we're going to do at work. It could be a habit we're going to try. It could be a a book we're going to get, whatever it might be. Let's make it something concrete. And think to yourself, when am I going to do that? And, and, and where will I be? And what might get in the way? And maybe if it's, it's relevant, you could put a note in your 
diary or in your phone, but try and find some way of taking that intention, that positive action that you want to take and really building it in so that it actually happens. Maybe this evening, maybe tomorrow, maybe this week. But this is action for happiness. That's where the real change happens. Okay, um, in a moment I'm going to stop for questions. Um, just wanted to remind you that tomorrow is the International Day of Happiness. That's the reason we, we put uh, this event on this evening, partly. It's actually made my life incredibly busy today. We've, uh, we've rather excitingly got some BBC news coverage. If you get home in time to catch the 10 o'clock news on BBC TV tonight, and there's hopefully going to be a feature on the World Happiness Report, which also comes out tomorrow, the International Day of Happiness, and featuring some lovely community activity from supporters of the Action for Happiness movement in Northampton. There's a lovely hub of activity there. We've got um, GPs, we've got people in the he mental health services, uh, educationalists using our work in schools. They've got, low, they've got, I think, six happy cafes, thank you, Stan, uh, in, in Northamptonshire, one of which has been filmed in today. And so that's going to be on the, the 10 o'clock news tonight. So tomorrow, International Day of Happiness, our theme for this year's campaign is happier together, trying to celebrate what we have in common rather than what divides us at this time when it feels polarised. Um, we want to sort of stand up and say, no, actually, the common humanity is what it will get us through this sense of otherness, you know, actually, there's much more that we have in common than that divides us, whatever side of the political spectrum that you're on. So do um, get involved. There's a dayofhappiness.net site, which is our big campaign site, the hashtag, uh, lots of activity tomorrow. Keep an eye out for stuff in the news. Um, and I wanted to share, or we'll end with just a phrase that I think hopefully, uh, you know, ties into what we've just done, thinking about what we're going to do and how we're going to be in the world. The world is changed by our example, not our opinion. We have so much opinion, so much debate, so much critique online. Let's be the change that we want to see in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here and for, for staying till the end. That's always rather nice. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to take any questions or observations, comments. I know I've been bombarding you with lots of things. There's some microphones, um, so if anyone would like to ask something or share something, or we can all go home. Um, <laughs> lady here, thank you. And then the gentleman in front as well afterwards. Hi. Um, there have been some really dreadful things going on internationally. Are you heartened like I am? by the Prime Minister of New Zealand, whose overriding love has just been an inspiration. I think what she has done is marvellous. She has not gone down the route of other. She's gone down the route of love and sharing. And I feel really um, open-hearted about that. I'm, I'm so grateful to you for saying that. And I think I'd just like to say that that completely resonates with me and I'm sure others in the room. Um, there's that lovely quote, I can't remember who it is, but um, you know, when in the face of disaster, always look for the helpers. Um, I can't remember the exact wording, but the thing that does give me hope in those situations is always the human response of kindness and generosity and compassion. Uh, I, I think she's a particularly exceptional example, I completely agree. As it happens, even before what's th this devastating recent event, she's, she's become a real advocate for well-being generally. I mean, she's actually saying that we're going to have a well-being budget, we're going to prioritise government spending based on what promotes well-being and she's doing lots of mental health so you know, even aside from that amazingly compassionate response to a horrific situation actually even more broadly she's saying no, that what the priority for our society is to kind of create human well-being and I think that's just exemplary leadership and I'd love to see more of that around the world and I, I do think things are changing although it doesn't feel like it um, one of the things that gives me hope uh, in relation to shifting priorities is that the, the OECD, the Club of Rich Nations, which of course was behind the obsession with GDP when it first was created in the 1930s, has more recently started saying, no, we need to be measuring well-being and happiness and, and what really matters and is now encouraging countries to measure that. Um, and, and I think over time, you know, in the next 10, 10 20 years, we're going to start seeing the whole landscape of what should be our priorities shifting towards that. And I, I hope that that means that when we do face our darkest of times, we'll have a capacity to be more compassionate and more tolerant and more forgiving of an understanding of, of you know, what's behind the, the darkness in our world and how we stop that ever happening again, really. So I'm really grateful to you for making that point. Thank you. Um, okay, and the gentleman in front, do you want to pass? Is the microphone still there? Oh, it's, oh, 
Uh, where's the other mic? Okay, so can you, can you pass it back to the gentleman here, and then, then did you have a question, Jake, as well? Was there one here? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's come here, and then we'll come to you in a moment. Thank you. Hi. Mahatma Gandhi's uh, favorite word was bliss rather than happiness. And also, Dalai Lama has expressed his uh, differentiation between happiness and bliss. Do you experience that bliss when you are happy, or do you think there is a difference between the two? Thank you. So is there a difference between bliss and happiness? I find the words in this space can potentially be unhelpful. So um, quite understandably, people have, a critique we've had of Action for Happiness has been about the, the H word. You know, are you telling people it's not okay to be unhappy? No, we're not. Are you telling people that, um, are you promoting some kind of glib, sort of smiley, happy um, thing? And um, So I, I, I find that some people like the word bliss, some people like the word contentment, some people like flourishing, thriving, feeling good, happiness, well-being. I'm actually not too worried about how people describe that. What I think is, what we're trying to describe here is a bit like Mathieu Ricard's quote at the beginning, this idea of a, uh, a sort of optimal state of being. So dealing well with what life throws at us, feeling you know, positive emotional states if that's possible, given what the situation we're in. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't use the word bliss very often myself, but I have genuinely experienced times of a, a deep calm and an amazing sense of oneness to others and uh, a very happy feeling in, in, that, in that deeper sense. So uh, I, I welcome people to describe that with whatever word they like and in whatever way. But I, I think those states are absolutely possible, and I think that it's actually, as again, both... Uh, Gandhi and the Dalai Lama would have said that a lot of that comes from when we help others. A lot of that real bliss and real contentment comes from looking beyond ourselves and being part of something bigger. So thank you for the question. And then over here. Yeah, I was just wondering whether you've had any um, high-profile British politicians uh, supporting Action for Happiness in any way. Because yes. I haven't noticed it. Uh, and there's an interesting question as to whether that would be helpful if they did as well. Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I, and I say that in all seriousness because, of course, public trust in politicians is, is being undermined. And I, and I would, of course, love to have politicians taking this seriously. Um, actually, in some ways, we've had something that's perhaps more helpful in some respects in, in the form of Gus O'Donnell. I don't know if anyone knows Gus O'Donnell, but he was the head of the... He was the cabinet secretary, the most senior civil servant in, in government. He served under Blair and Brown and uh, Cameron. And, you know, it was not on either side of the political spectrum. He's just putting this into practice. And he is passionate about this agenda and would like to see... He said if he was Prime Minister and what he'd like to see any future Prime Minister doing is sitting around the Cabinet table and saying, right, tell me what your department's going to do to improve national well-being, whether it's transport, health, um, you know, pensions, education. How are you promoting well-being for current and future generations? He thinks that should be the ultimate question that a Prime Minister asks any of the you know, ministerial leads. And... It's beginning to happen. I don't want to name any specific names, but on both sides of the political spectrum, there are people who are showing more interest in this. I don't think anyone's really fully got it and embraced it yet, and I really do hope that happens. Um, but the fact that some of the policy-making people who are sort of almost non-partisan are taking this seriously. I mean, Gus is recommending that the, the, the green book that government uses. It's, it's a, it's a the guidebook that it uses to make policy decisions, to evaluate different options. It's conventionally looked at just economic measures. Now takes on board well-being. So when we're saying you know, a great example of policy making. So when it thinks about, should we close down these local libraries? If you look through the economic lens, it's like, well, yeah, they're losing money. Uh, that doesn't make us any revenue. We could sell the land and build housing on it. But when you look through the well-being lens, it's like, well, no, the libraries are the heart of the community. People get together. There's friendship. There's learning, creativity. It completely changes that decision um, through the well-being lens. So I, I want to see more policy being made in that way. And I, I hope more and more sort of um, parliamentarians will take that seriously. There are various... Um, parliamentary working groups that focus on this stuff, but I, I don't think anyone's quite embraced it in the way I'd like yet. Richard Layard, obviously, being someone who's in the political realm, is an exception, but a member of the House of Lords rather than an active um, MP. Um, we are rapidly running out of time. Um, let's take one final question, and then I'd just like to make a quick announcement. Oh, you, oh you've got a microphone already with someone, have you? It's a lady over there. Lady over here. Thank you very much. You have a microphone. Yeah do anything on stoicism 
uh, because mm. I, I find so, uh, understanding stoicism is probably a, a, a quite a good way to mm. exist in today's world. And also, I just wondered about the whole idea of fear, because we're driven by fear in our world, and it's, an awful lot of it is coming from the media. So how do we, if we're going to collectively try and change the world, mm. try and take on the media and the way they promote fear, and they divide and rule us. I understand that in New Zealand there was a, a, a massive massacre, and that is really terrible, but there's massacres every day in Syria and all over, and we don't, as a media, look at those and don't look at the way we're going. So... I just wondered what can we can do to take on the media. And the last point is we need to value ourselves more because you can't really make anybody else happy unless you're happy yourself. Thank you. Three brilliant points. So on stoicism, I agree. And I think that CBT, sort of the ABC model, is, is sort of grounded in stoic principles. As if you can't change what happens, you can change how you respond to it. But yeah, I, I, I agree that the ancient Greeks had a lot of... Uh, wisdom in that. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned the media point because the one announcement I was going to make at the end was that our next talk in here in April, and I must have, I must have, I can't exactly remember the date, but it was on our little thing at the beginning, and I'll send an email out to people tomorrow. But we have Jodie Jackson, who's been a long-standing member of the Action for Happiness community, um, who's written a brilliant book on our relationship with the media, and absolutely agrees with what you're saying that it has this huge sort of toxic impact on our culture, so what can we do? And there's a tension here, because we could at one level sort of shut it out and get on and, and perhaps live more joyously, ignoring what's going on in the world, and there's another level that says, well, hang on, well, how do we stay socially engaged and campaign for the things that we care about? Uh, and so she's going to address that issue. So I won't try and answer that question. I, I think it's a really good point, and if you want to know the answer to the lady's great question, come along in April, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll all find out. And then finally, I'd just like to end, actually, because we are now at half past, with the last point you made, which is that yes, actually, this, this starts with us, not just for what we can do for others, but what we can do for ourselves. That I was, um, I was blessed to be in the World Happiness Summit where I was speaking in Miami um, uh, at the weekend, which is an amazing experience. Huge growing support for what we're doing in America now as well. People are saying they need it now more than ever. Um, and on the plane on the way back, as they did the briefing, I was reminded of that whole oxygen mask principle of, you know, before you help others with their masks, look after yourself. And... Uh, although we see all these amazing um, journeys that people become more compassionate through being involved in these activities and they learn that you know, kindness is a great source of happiness, the thing I see over and over again in our community is people who are actually already doing a lot for others, probably many of you in this room, especially carers, parents of young children, healthcare practitioners, counsellors, people who do so much for others and are actually not very good at looking after themselves. And if we're struggling and we're not able to be kind to ourselves, we can't really make as big a difference in the world. So I think let's go out with that thought that actually um, the best way to, to bring happiness to others is to, uh, is to start by finding the things that help make us feel happy and be kind to ourselves. And, uh, and one of the best ways to be kind to ourselves is also to remember to be kind to others. So it's a virtuous circle. Thank you so much for being here. See you again soon.